Hello, let's talk about politics and governance. Let's tackle today hate speech on social media. We welcome our two guests, Darren Lilliker from Bournemouth University and Marta Perez Escolar from the Universidad Loyola Andalusia. And they will talk about um, xenophobic attitudes towards immigrants in the UK and in Spain, specifically within right-wing community pages. So in this episode, we uh, dive into uh, challenges of content moderation and how addressing underlying societal conditions might be the key to combating hate speech. Darren and Marta, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Darren, I'll start with you. It might be quite obvious, uh, but tell us about the importance of studying hate speech on social media and its impact on democratic societies. Well, hate speech has been recognized as a, a, a serious problem in, in many de democratic societies. And the problem is that it emerges out of the sort of enclaves online. And so uh, in us looking at Reddit, it's not 4chan, 8chan. It's not one of these sites where we know the alt-right and, and you know, extreme right um, congregate. But it's a midway space between in social media between the sort of more moderated Twitter and Facebook and the, the normal I guess, you know, um, spaces for the hard right. And when they are demonizing refugees, migrants, which are often used as a, you know, a it, it's a term that has no real kind of definition. It's just outsiders to a country that can become normalized and the more that, that content is repeated and shared, the more people may accept that this is an accepted view. And the alt-right itself talks about the Overton window, this sort of um, space of which uh, there are acceptable views that can be held and can be shared. And they like to say that they are extending the Overton window. They are moving it towards being less accepting of outsiders. And I think that in some ways they are right. And that's why it's important to study this. What were, uh, still with you, Darren, what were uh, your expectations, yours and Marta's expectations that um, prompted this investigation? Well, the thing they wanted to understand was not just whether hate speech exists and what terminology is used, but also how it's thematically organized. So how is an anti immigrant or migrant statement constructed? What are the key um, reasons why they argue that we should be concerned about migrants and refugees? Why are they a danger to our society? What is, what's the way in which, uh, as we say in um, so academic language, how are they framed? Who are they as people? How do they interact with our society? Uh, and that was the bit we wanted to get um, a, a better understanding of, because these themes can then move out, be discussed further, become headlines in the mainstream media. Of course, it's a great kickoff for what's coming. So, Marta, tell us about the findings. Well, we have identified three important frames expressed in online conversations, Reddit, Facebook, and Forocoches. Uh, Forocoches is supposed to be an online forum for talking about the things related to cars. And uh, in this online conversation, uh, as I said, uh, we have identified three uh, important frames that represent different types of hate speech against immigrants. And these speeches, ideas, or expression can be easily translated into real life situation and we think that for this reason, it's important to the first detect them and uh, then uh, to, uh, to identify tools, materials, and uh, other things to combat them. So the first frame describes immigrants as leeches. In this case, immigrants are described as um, as taking jobs away from British workers, for example, uh, or taking uh, taking advantage of uh, Spanish uh, public service. 
And these comments relating to this uh, frame are mixed. Some promote hostility by framing immigrants as uh, competitors for resources who are uh, advantaged by the system, but other comments do include uh, pejorative uh, terms. The second important frame involves uh, arguing that immigrants do not uh, possess the same values as the British or Spanish, and so they will not follow established norms and laws of uh, society. And they have, since they have different value and they, their lack of uh, loyalty to the nation position, then has potential criminals. And the last one, the third common frame, explore the notion of the clash uh, of uh, civilization. This frame is a key, uh, key feature of uh, Islamophobic discourses and a strong Islamophobic uh, attitudes. Great. This, uh, about these uh, three frames that you mentioned. Uh, Darren, I'm curious to know more about potential policy uh, implications of, of these findings, of these uh, three frames. What can you tell about us about that? Well, I think the first area is that the debate about free speech, and it seems that we have a, a quite polarised debate where um, there is a, a position where speech has to be um, censured and, and certain views should not be expressed and hate speech is against the values of our society, and then there is a debate that, well, free speech is a, a, a right that everyone has. Everyone should be able to express our views. And I think this debate has become very polarised, as I said, but, but also kind of very politicised. You know, some parties will promote one side, other parties promote the other side. And this is one thing that needs to be really sort of discussed in society about what is acceptable. You know, should we be able to say the sort of language that that all refugees are potential criminals, all refugees are, you know, potentially you know, a threat to our, our values and our systems and, and that they don't belong within our cultures. Um, and and you know, using, um, as some of the, the, the arguments do, that, that you know, one, one person who is a migrant who, is a, who commits a crime is representative of them all. And so, yeah, it's those sorts of things around free speech that should be discussed. And I think a further one about um, education generally and the way that people learn about migrants. And you know, if we have a, a, an atmosphere where migrants are being constantly you know, demonized and, and treated as the other and described as a threat, you know, this is a problem. You know, all of us probably descend from migrants. We may go back, you know, sort of centuries, literally, but we all descend from, we've all moved somewhere. And I think that that sense of, you know, our land and our borders and protection has been something that has built up in societies. It calmed down a little, but now it seems to be getting much more potent in people's minds that we need to protect things. And that, so that education about, A, what migrants bring to a society, but also, you know, our own backgrounds, our own histories um, could make people think slightly differently about, about these migrants and, and also be a little more empathetic about where they come from. And I think another one is, is breaking that down, you know, that this group, this, this idea of migrants being this homogenous blob of people, you know, that, that have no identities, but there's all sorts of different reasons why people move. You know, so are they migrants because of climate change? Are they migrants because of war, which makes them refugees? Are they migrants because of persecution, which makes them asylum seekers? You know, all these differences are often lost, even in mainstream media reporting sometimes. And so having that broader you know, so set of definitions of, of what is a migrant, um, I think is important. And so through communication policy, perhaps, definitely through the tone in which politicians talk and also through education and greater understanding of our histories and past, um, we can do something to redress some of this, as well as then, you know, that question about what we do about free speech 
um, and, and how shall social media platforms um, behave and, and deal with content properly, as opposed to claiming to, but not doing so. Absolutely. So you have given us from your research uh, three key frames. And uh, Darren, you've given us uh, three um, potential policy uh, implications for the future. Marta, let's look at the future now. So how can we, in terms of research, how can we keep framing these, uh, this hate speech you mentioned before? So new social media platforms to look at, new geographies, or perhaps debating what is acceptable or not to say, educate the audiences, as Darren said, aiming for politicians, lawmakers. So tell us what's ahead of us now. Yeah, well, uh, given the debates around immigration in both countries, it is useful uh, to continue to detect, detect how media also frame migrants or refugees, mm -hmm. which are different kind of uh, perspective, mm -hmm. and contribute to expanding hate speech. It will be also interesting to know how much this kind of speech is infected by uh, political discourses. In fact, due to high profile cases where politicians have been accused of uh, using uh, pejorative language when they portray migrants or refugees, we think detecting how supporters of the most extreme parties in Spain and UK uh, uh, construct arguments that may filter into online discourses or media. So, for us, these are the two maybe mm -hmm. uh, ways to 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 propose new further further uh, studies. Okay, and uh, well, either to explore the topic that we uh, talked about, these frames that we talked about, and also to support future research. Marta, could you recommend some additional materials, some additional content for our listeners to um, to access? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, some public uh, institution like United Na Nations launched in June 2019 a report in response to the alarming trends of growing xenophobia, racism, and intolerance. Uh, the report is, uh, is uh, on, on the website of the United Nations. It's called United Nations Strategy and Plan of Action on Hate Speech. There is another important report published in 2017 uh, uh, by the Council of Europe. Uh, the name is Taking Action Against Hate Speech. And also other uh, organized institutions. Uh, Ofcom, for example, also explore the impact of uh, online uh, hate speech uh, relating to people with different uh, protective uh, characteristics. Um, the Alan Turing Institute, that is the UK's National Institute for uh, Data Science and Art Artificial Intelligence, created uh, a hub for online uh, hate research. So mainly these are also the main uh, materials publication that we encourage people to read, to, to just check carefully. And if they want to, to know more about the consequences, the implication of uh, hate speech. Perfect. And for those who are watching us, um... On, on our website, on Let's Talk About Politics and Governance website, if you scroll down below the video of our talk, you can find the uh, materials that Marta has shared with us. In this conversation, we have focused very, very clearly, structurally, on what were your expectations, uh, the key frames that you identified online, the three main tips for um, policy implications, and looking ahead. And Darren, I'm going to ask you for uh, a wrap-up of all this. So in conclusion, Darren, what key message or takeaway would you like our audience to remember from this discussion? Well, I think firstly, um, the hate speech we see online is part of our society. People believe and have these beliefs and have these opinions. And so it's part of who we are and it's something that we need to deal with. And the more they're repeated, the more normalized they become. 
and normalization can lead to acceptance and then can lead to discrimination and in extreme cases can lead to violence against those people, against refugees, migrants, or people who are perceived to possibly be migrants and refugees. Um, and so we are that the narratives need to change, both at the political level, in the media, um, but also within society more broadly, through our education, within households, within schools, within colleges and universities, you know, to really sort of talk about refugees, talk about the issues, but also talk about hate speech. And to get more people to think, would I say this in public? Would I, would I say this that I'm going to say online? Would I express this in public? And I think that could go some way to making people think twice about what they're saying. Darren, Marta, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for our listeners that are watching us on YouTube, you can find, as I said before, all the resources and materials of this conversation on the Let's Talk About Politics and Governance website, both the recommended materials and the article uh, in which this conversation was based on. You can also listen to this episode wherever you get your podcast. You can subscribe to our newsletter if you scroll down, and you can follow us on Twitter at Cogitatio LTA.